Hi everyone, this is Katie DeFrancesco, and I'm going to be talking about Stephen Shapin's A Social History of Truth. You'll be reading the basic summary of Shapin's arguments this week, along with Chapter 4. First, I'm going to talk about some of the essential concepts from this monograph, and then I'll go through the main points that I thought were interesting in each chapter. Finally, we'll look into the critical reception for this title. So who is Stephen Shapin? Right now, Dr. Shapin is at Harvard, but at the time of publication, he was a professor of sociology at UCSD. You'll notice that he's been on both history and sociology faculties, and his works are interdisciplinary. Also, although Dr. Shapin's US-based, he's had international visiting appointments throughout his career. Here we have some of the essential points to take away from A Social History of Truth. First, although we tend to think of the scientific method as requiring total skepticism, Shapin argue, argues that in order to build a body of scientific knowledge, the participants have to negotiate ways to trust one another. It's impossible to replicate every experiment for yourself to prove a basic knowledge by personal experience. So a scientist has to take a certain amount of previously published knowledge on faith according to his or her own judgment. In making this point, Shapin outlines his own conception of truth, rather than a restrictive definition, limiting the concept to objective realities about the world that exist outside our minds, he takes a liberal definition, situating truth within human minds and cultures. Societies work together to construct truth. This doesn't mean that objective reality doesn't exist, but by our nature, we have to interpret it. A society can't work together to produce widely accepted knowledge unless we have some kind of agreed upon interpretation of the truth. From this definition of truth, Shapin arrives at a probabilistic view of the scientific method. What we know is based on the information we judge to be truthful, and those judgments are situated in our social context. Science then is based on probability, what is probably true, rather than objective certainty. Shapin uses the development of experimental science in early modern England, and in particular, Robert Boyle, as case studies that demonstrate how this work of building truth is accomplished. Let's move on to chapter one. This is where Shapin establishes his theoretical framework for the detailed historiography following in subsequent chapters. The takeaways here are that in order to build a body of knowledge, we need to negotiate ways of identifying reliable testimony. Normative discourses of authority are one way human societies accomplish this. We've been talking about discourses of authority and how they can lead to oppression within societies, but it's important to understand they also serve important functions, and this is one of them. In early modern England, the bases of reliability were considered to be free action. A person was more reliable if they were less encumbered by bias, in particular the bias created by being economically dependent on others and on labor to support oneself and virtue. In this particular culture, virtue is associated with Christianity and adherence to norms of civility, but we can understand it more generally as proper motivation. In our modern scientific culture, we expect scientists to be disinterested and not to pursue knowledge for their own personal gain or to use that knowledge to hurt others. This would be a more modern conception of virtue. Chapter two begins the explanation of how early modern English culture privileged the gentleman as a reliable truth teller. Shapin outlines how the label of gentleman was applied and what factors played into that application, including inherited economic means, freedom from work, and adherence to a discipline or moral code held in common. The concept of gentility was not static and was problematized and debated within early modern English society. So there was not universal agreement about who a gentleman was or what he did. Chapter three outlines the specific practices of recognizing and prescribing truthfulness. It explores the concept of unreliability and how less privileged classes and women were figured as unreliable. Here we also have a discussion of the practices by which reliability was disputed among gentlemen. So if you're interested in a detailed discussion of the mechanics of duels, this is the chapter to read. The duel was al almost always framed as an accusation that a gentleman was a liar, and the public charge of untruthfulness was often settled by combat. 
Shapin argues that the modes and practices of civility were meant to prevent violence by allowing errors to be uncovered and corrected without direct conflict or confrontation. You did not want to directly accuse your colleague of being wrong or falsifying data because you might find yourself on the dueling ground. On to chapter four, which everyone will be reading this week. This is a detailed profile of Robert Boyle and how he exercised the credibility conveyed by his status to build a reputation that allowed his scientific innovations to be relied upon. Shapin argues that Boyle's personal identity was constructed from elements of the discourses of gentlemanly discipline, Christian morality, and classical scholarship. Boyle himself was a creator of this identity, and it served as a paradigm for others engaging in experimental knowledge production. Shapin terms this paradigmatic identity the Christian virtuoso. This chapter goes into the ways in which early experimental scientists negotiated skepticism of traditional sources of knowledge and scholarly practices with trust in the other members of their community, in this case, the Royal Society of London. Shapin identifies seven maxims from various sources in early modern English literature that allow gentlemen scientists to evaluate testimony for truthfulness, and they're summarized here. Plausibility, replicability, consistency, immediacy, knowledgeability or skill of sources, disinterestedness, and integrity of sources. As you can see, many of these maxims can be traced to our modern scientific culture as well. In chapter six, Shapin offers several case studies demonstrating the function of reliability and credibility in early modern scientific practice. This chapter takes on issues of dispute resolution and the integration of conflicting narratives. Shapin argues that our knowledge of the people in our community of practice is inextricably tied to our knowledge of things of the world around us. Chapter seven goes into the ways that the rules of civility allowed the community of practice to function. Shapin argues that early modern experimental scientists frowned upon theoretical derivation, preferring physical experimentation, reporting on physical phenomena that the community member had himself observed, allowed the maxims of reliable testimony to be utilized. Theoretical derivation stipulated faith in classical modes of knowledge, of which Boyle and his colleagues were skeptical. Chapter eight explores the invisible practitioners and influencers behind work like Boyle's. Shapin explores dynamics of mastery and servitude, classes of servitude within personal laboratories, and the individuals presented testimony as based in a collective effort. The master though is positioned as the arbiter of truth. Shapin also touches on the role of women in early modern English intellectual life. Educated women were definitely active in knowledge production in the arenas of moral life, for example, but were restricted from fields like experimental science by strong cultural norms. Shapin ends the book by making connections between the scientific community of Robert Boyle and the ways that we conceive of and practice science now. In some ways, the locus of scientific reliability has shifted from personal identities of those in communities of practice to institutional identities. While outsiders may judge the reliability of modern scientific information based on institutional repute now, those within scientific communities of practice still utilize personal modes of interaction to produce and evaluate knowledge. Now we move on to the critical reception of a social history of truth. It was generally positive with some exceptions. Uh, I've listed several themes that occurred in multiple reviews here, um, and the interpretive readings by reviewers were definitely mediated by their disciplinary background. First, let's look at some reviews by sociologists. This is the field from which Shapin received the sharpest criticism. Schuster and Berry accuse him of being atheoretical and abandoning principles of the sociology of scientific knowledge, a field that Shapin helped shape. They felt that he was too focused on Robert Boyle as an origin story for ex experimental science to the exclusion of his discursive surroundings, continuities from earlier history and parallel developments. Others like Hacking express admiration for Shapin's illustration of the construction of trust norms.
Within the field of philosophy, there were also supporters and detractors. Daston, whose work is cited in A Social History of Truth, argues that the work has broad relevance for sociologists, historians, and philosophers of science, despite its potentially inflammatory title. Martinic criticizes Shapin's prose as overwritten and murky and implies that his arguments are of limited use for the field of philosophy. The title was generally well received by historians. Stewart, in my opinion, correctly points out that Shapin's work on Boyle is a case study rather than an origin story, demonstrating how truth and reliability may be constructed rather than claiming that Boyle personally created experimental science. Instead, what Shapin says he created was a personal identity that became a major paradigm that influenced the development of scientific communities. Osler, however, argues that there is more to truth than trust, taking a more restrictive rather than liberal view of truth. She feels that Shapin is a bit too dismissive of the role of science in revealing objective realities. Thank you for listening. And I hope that the notes in these slides help you as you navigate the summary of arguments and chapter four this week.